John's asked me to tell you a mission story from our time in Africa. But to set the stage, I need to tell you something about the country and the hospital in which the events of the story occurred. This is a map of Kenya in equatorial East Africa. Nairobi, the capital, is in the southern portion of the Central Highlands and 225 miles to the northwest across the Rift Valley and beyond Maasai Mara into the western highlands is Tenwick Hospital. And this is the view from the air as you're coming in. Tenwick is a 325-bed general hospital, the largest and best mission hospital in Kenya, and one of the largest mission hospitals in all the African continent. As you come down the dirt road leading to the hospital, this is the first thing you see. They're signed with their name and the four powerful words of the mission statement, we treat Jesus heals. And this is the entrance to the hospital, and I would ask you to compare it with the entrance to Hogue Hospital in the beautiful new women's pavilion. Because Hogue and Tenwick have a number of things in common. First, they're similar in size. Secondly, they're both associated with Christian churches. And thirdly, like Hogue, Tenwick draws patients from a considerable area because of its reputation for providing the best quality medical care in that area. But that's where the similarities end because while Hogue is well-funded and has the latest and best of everything, Tenwick is chronically underfunded, understaffed, and under-equipped. There is no CT, there is no MRI, the operating rooms are antiquated, and disposable items that Hogue throws away after one use are washed and reused again and again and again until they literally fall apart. But it's also the best they have. And into this less than perfect institution, come the sickest patients I've ever seen. Sicker by far than the average patient coming to an American hospital. Sicker because access to medical care is difficult. Virtually no one here owns a car and public transportation is slow and unreliable. Sicker because preventative medicine is rarely practiced here. And sicker because even in a hospital where a complete obstetrical ultrasound is $2.50, and the bill for a major surgical procedure, including doctors, hospitals, medicines, is $250, the patient still can't afford it. You take the inadequacies of this hospital and the sickness of the patients and put them together, and it sounds like a recipe for disaster. But when I think of Tenwick, I always think of Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says he has been given a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being proud, and three times he asks the Lord to remove it, and each time the answer is the same. My grace is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness. And certainly God's power is abundantly manifest in the weaknesses of Tenwick Hospital. And now for the story. It was 11.30 at night, and I had just gotten soundly asleep when the phone rang. The nurse that night in the emergency room was very intelligent, very experienced. She had seen everything and was phased by nothing. But there was a edge in her voice and she said, Dr. Westerout, I have a patient up here who's bleeding to death and I need to see you right now. Needless to say, I was wide awake, jumped into my shoes and ran up the hill to the hospital and into the emergency room and there saw one of the sickest people I have ever seen. It's difficult at first glance to tell anemia in Kenyan patients because of the pigment in their skin, but this lady was not black, she was gray. Her pulse was rapid, her breathing was rapid, her blood pressure was falling, she was lying in a pool of blood, and it was immediately apparent that the nurse was entirely correct. She was far down the road to bleeding to death. The blood bank had been called, and they said that they had only six units of blood in the whole hospital, none of which matched her blood type. Her story had begun a number of hours before in one of the remote villages where she had delivered uneventfully her third child and everything went well until they tried to deliver the placenta and it wouldn't come. And then bleeding began. Her native attendants had used everything at their disposal, all the traditional remedies, but nothing worked and it became apparent that she was going to have to go to the hospital. The problem was the village was so remote and so poor that there were no cars and so in the dark in the middle of the night on a makeshift shift stretcher. They had to carry her for almost an hour to the nearest motorized transportation, and then it was another 45 minutes to the hospital. A quick examination made it apparent that this lady was almost certainly going to die no matter what we did, but if she had any remote chance at all, it was to take her quickly to surgery and as fast as possible remove the uterus and try to stop the bleeding before she died. 
And so without even moving her to a transfer gurney, the nurse and I grabbed the bed and ran across the small plaza that separated the emergency room from the operating room. And while we scrubbed and gowned and gloved, other nurses pulled instruments and suture and drapes. And in just a few minutes, we were standing by the table ready to go. And then something happened that is unique in my experience and has never happened in any other hospital in which I've worked. Everything stopped, we bowed our heads, and in the Kipsigi language, which is what the patient spoke, the anesthesiologist began to pray. Because one of the great traditions at Tenwick is that before all surgery, no matter how minor or how major, no matter how routine or how catastrophically emergent, as in this case, we always pray before surgery. And so he asked that God would be with us as we operated, that he would give us clear minds and steady hands, and that if it was his will, this patient might be restored to normal health. And as he spoke, a great sense of peace and calm came over that chaotic scene. And the presence of God was as intensely palpable as any time I had ever experienced. Talking to one of the nurses who was working with me afterwards, she said she had experienced the same thing. It was so vivid that we could almost believe that if we opened our eyes and looked across the table, we would see Jesus Christ standing there saying, don't worry, just do the best you can and I'll take care of everything else. Well, the prayer was soon finished, a quick anesthetic was given, and we made the first incision and it was like doing an autopsy, there was virtually no bleeding and I truly thought the patient had died. I turned to the anesthesiologist and said, is she gone? He said, no, she's still here, but hurry. Well, to make a very long story short, we were able to complete the surgery and the bleeding was stopped. As the bleeding came under control, the blood pressure stabilized. Two of the missionaries, who happened to be the same blood type, came up during the middle of the night and each gave a pint of blood, which was, of course, nowhere near what she had lost, but was enough to at least get her through the first critical hours after surgery. And after a somewhat difficult two-week post-operative course, she went home alive and well to be with her family. And that evening, I was writing to John an email talking about some of the things that had happened at Tenwick. And at the end of the email, I said, John, if you know of people in our congregation who are skeptics and don't believe that miracles happen in this modern time, send them out here. Because at Tenwick Hospital, miracles of healing occur on a daily basis. And finally, reading from Luke, the fourth chapter and the 40th verse, as the sun went down that evening, throughout the village, people brought their sick relatives to Jesus. And no matter what the disease, the touch of his hand healed everyone. A focused sacramental vision for biblical faithfulness. A focused sacramental vision for the care of our own community and ministering to each other as we minister to Annie and she ministers to us as she did, hadn't she? <laughs>